block on our agenda that we want to cover is, uh, I think I called it future and related work. Um, future, because whenever you do something like this, you never completely finish. Everything that you'd like to do in a given amount of time, there's you always uncover new questions when you, every time you make an answer, you unco uncover three new questions kind of thing. Um, no, that's a presentation we already did. Uh, but it's also because, uh, I also wanted to put this up because uh, today's presentations really are focusing on what we did in this project that was uh, not completely but mostly directly related to the development of the Envision Decision Support Tool. And there, there has been other stuff going on as well within the project that I want to at least briefly mention. Um, and also uh, both that category of work and the, the future possibilities and aspirations is also um, just uh, an attempt to engage with other people out there, either uh, listening to the webinar now or maybe coming across it later and looking at it on the web um, in case there's uh, some good prospects for potential collaboration in the future. We'd love to hear from you. So uh, all of the ideas that uh, I'll be putting up here, I haven't put any another author list, another great big long author list or anything, but uh, these have been pulled from submissions from uh, the rest of the presenters here, other people that have worked with us uh, throughout the project. Um, uh, through in discussions we've had, especially in the past few weeks, getting ready for this, but also it's you know our, ide our ideas have been shaped by discussions that we had in that farmers workshop, in uh, the workshops we had with conservation authorities and planners and resource managers and so on uh, earlier on in the project. Um, um, everybody that we've talked to, and I've tried to go sort of uh, near term already happened but we haven't really talked about it today and move towards longer term possibilities uh, uh, it, through this presentation. So first we, besides me bringing it up once and, uh, and alluding to some of them, we've not really talked about all the general uh, resilience indicators uh, um, that have been worked on. Uh, so. I wanted to call attention to it now because it's been it's been going on since the original Fields to Regions project, uh, but also specifically part of this project. So uh, Ruth, Livia, and Patricia especially have been pulling together lots of information on this. And Patricia Larkin um, uh, ran workshops for us during this project that uh, some in the audience may have been uh, invited to or participated in. and, and uh, through that consultation, these are the there were, there were urban planners there and conservation authority people, uh, public health people, um, and general resource managers. And through consultation with all these people, uh, she put together a database of potential indicators. Really uh, breaking it down into these are things. This is information people would like to know about to be able to help uh, adapt to climate change. This is stuff that we do have already and is really useful. This is stuff that uh, we'd like to see if the data is available to get it. All these sort of different categories of availability and feasibility. Um, and so that's up on our website, uh, the, the, the sort of the raw database version of it. Um, and also, uh, um, uh, Livia at uh, IISD, they worked on putting that, summarizing that uh, information, getting it distilled down into a briefing note, which I just got the email, I came in while we were sitting here, of the URL that, uh, where that briefing note has now been published. So we'll be adding that link to our own website uh, maybe tomorrow. We're still busy here today. Um, and uh, there's also a, a journal paper following up. In fact, it's been sitting in my inbox waiting for me to, to go through and read it. Um, so you'll see a lot more about uh, uh, the, those indicators if you access those resources. Um, so this slide, this category is for what I've called uh, short-term plans, where that means it's in progress and, and uh, it's just we haven't uh, talked about it as much today. Okay, I was happy to see actually that and I just did go, go through uh, the, the details of why we uh, want to, uh, why we, both why we didn't concentrate on it till now, but also why we want to add in the ten, the, the option to pull in that 10 kilometer gridded data. Uh, 
could just be for visualization purposes if there are problems and just to be clear that some of the problems that you can have not so much with the historical data because that has been evaluated and and especially in this part of the world it's known to not have sort of you know big problems going through the interpolation process but uh, when you downscale the GCM predictions to that fine grid it's known that sometimes you can have instability problems like where you go from one grid cell to the next one you get large jumps in the values that may not make much sense um, but we know that about it and we'll document that on the website and but we want to see you say so in this part of the world how bad is it maybe it's bad in some situations not bad in other places and also we would like to be able to run our indicator calculation at the finer spatial scales and see how they perform as well um, so that's all I'll start it like Anna said, the, it's just the process of running the scripts to process all the data. Um, we want to be able to uh, compare those phenology indicators that Anna just uh, uh, talked about developing to actual uh, historic production data. That's uh, uh, actually work that she wanted to get into her thesis and there just wasn't time in two years to do that too, so she already has all the data and we just <coughs> run, the, run the analysis to make that comparison. Um, and, uh, well, I should say we have some production data. This, that's always a, a big uh, gap sometimes, trying to get uh, decent amounts of quality uh, agriculture production data sometimes is an issue. Um, we are exploring hydrological modeling, and Cameron uh, Sampson, uh, an MSc student, is here in the audience, um, has uh, been working hard on that through his master's. Um, and there is already some hydrological models uh, available in the Envision framework, and uh, but in his work, he, he found it hard to get that specific model to work well in this region, at least in the watershed he's concentrating on, so he has moved to a different modeling regime. and. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get these hydrological models working properly and it's just started behaving for him. Uh, in other words, he's found some good parameterization and data to, and a good combination of parameterization data and uh, specific model code to mimic the behavior of, uh, of river discharge, concentrating on that in this area. And, um, and he'll, his work is being used to inform future directions for what we might want to do in Envision, but we've sort of kept it out of the Envision framework until we understand what kind of modeling is going to work here. And of course, we're working on getting this all out the door, uh, not just through webinars, but through ap academic papers as well. Looking a little further out, there's, there's, there's more than this, but this is a summary of some of the stuff that uh, we've been talking about recently, and some of these have come up in some of the other presentations, but I wanted everything all in one place. I say medium or longer term options because it's a long list, so some priority setting is going to have to go on. We can't do also three, five, maybe even ten years. Well, maybe we could in ten. But in any case, we'll have to decide what's going to be worked on by whom and how it's going to get paid for and so on. Um, this includes refining those crop indicators using more information than just temperature and precipitation. Uh, Anna might have just said that, I can't remember. Um, but for example, bringing in soil moisture and evapotranspiration. Uh, uh, adding more crops, which could mean more crop rotations, more complicated rotations, more, uh, more analysis of what crop rotations would be appropriate in this area and what they might shift to. That, all that kind of stuff could be on the table. Um, and also bringing in indicators that apply to a broader range of crops. Like it's been said a couple times, we've really concentrated in the field crops on corn and soy because they really dominate this region. Uh, that's, they don't dominate as much in other regions, and so adding more crops it would be important for expanding pasture use in Ontario, but it also uh, you know, moves into more of the details in this region and more of the future possibilities, I suppose, too. Um, within a crop, add in different varieties. So we know that a lot of uh, the pressures that uh, exist, uh, that come from the weather on the farmers is, is something that, uh, you know, this is not news to them and it's not news to the agricultural industry and there's lots of research and development going on on developing different varieties that are less prone to failure or to yield reductions from some of these pressures. So that's something uh, that can be done quite easily in the model as we've got it because all those parameters uh, uh, that 
that although those thresholds that say when there's going to be a problem and what the crop's response to it uh, would be, those could all be adjusted to uh, to fit different varieties. But that data would have to be developed, the appropriate scenarios have to be developed, and, uh, and, and the, do the comparisons. Um, improving farm operations, I grouped a bunch of suggestions under this uh, one category. For example, better treatment of wet soil, what are the impacts of that on farm operations? Um, uh, more explicit treating, treatment of seeding operations, including cultivation, uh, improved, uh, so I guess I put in rotation twice, I forget what I've done, why I've done that, might be something Dan said and I've forgotten the details of. By the way, everybody feel free to chime in if I'm saying something wrong or if I'm not fully developing something. Um, impacts of distance on planting choice and uh, and uh, I think uh, Tony also brought up uh, impacts of distance on uh, uh, what more complicated logic about what farmers might consider when expanding a farm. Um, keep exploring the weather data options. We've uh, mentioned some of the media stuff we're doing right now, but for example, can we bring in more variables than just temperature and precipitation? Um, get improved confidence in the spatial variability? Uh, can we get better uh, GCM scenarios that, uh, and that potentially things that would help us refine the ability to look at extreme events? And maybe do we need to move away from GCM scenarios and get into a, some kind of weather generator model that uh, does better treatment of variability? Uh, we would like improved yield forecasts. You may have noticed, like if you may had, if your eyes were sharp looking at some of the actual uh, screenshots or, or actually live views of the Envision interface, there are yield outputs possible, but we don't have any confidence in those yield outputs. They're from a really simple linear regression model developed by uh, the insurance industry for uh, a part of Ontario for, for very different purposes, and it's in there because it's something that could be put in easily. We'd like to have uh, some better logic driving yield forecasts, so instead uh, we've concentrated on yield penalty, penalties. What are the yield reductions? Because that's at least backed up by the research into what typical reductions are for given events. Um, uh, a couple of people have mentioned uh, I'd like to bring in uh, thinking and logic on what are the impacts of, of climate on livestock operations as sort of the basic database is in there to, to enable getting started on this, but we haven't done any uh, work specific to livestock yet, in, in the model at least. Um, soil erosion calculation is something we could add. Um, uh, ex uh, more expanding the different kinds of farms and different uh, 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 what Tanya called farmer typology, so that you could consider the diversity of farmers that exist within a sector, letting them have different uh, agent types in the model, make it affecting how they make their how they make their decisions. Uh, I I grouped these ones together in slide five under the title expansion possibilities. So this is really you know taking this uh, work in new directions, and uh, obviously. Uh, uh, or perhaps, obviously, one thing would to be done is, is you know, now do this in different regions besides Eastern Ontario. It's worth noting we had a, a sister project that also spun off of the field to regions work uh, in Eastern Ontario that developed an Envision database and adapted some of the same models, but for different purposes uh, in PEI, and was concentrating more on. Um, uh, it was hydrological modeling to be able to influence, uh, to assess things through erosion. That's pretty much what the focus of Shane's work was. Uh, I think it was river flows. River oh, flows. Yeah. yeah, I know they're they're concerned about erosion, but part of the idea was that we could lead into that. Um, we've also had uh, discussions with. Uh, uh, the Ontario Climate Consortium people working out of the Toronto Region Conservation Authority about uh, potentially setting up uh, a framework and database like this for Peel Region. Uh, framework the personnel changes and both on our side and their side and, and uh, that hasn't gotten as go going as, as fast as I thought it might at some point but uh, that's certainly something I'd be interested in talking about uh, with them more. Uh, um, 
Uh, we've already uh, mentioned uh, back at the last webinar and in continuing discussions with the people involved that the, the group from Risk Science, Risk Sciences International, um, I didn't double check if that's the right uh, acronym expansion. I didn't double check good. Offset process. Uh, so the, uh, on the one hand, they have a parallel project or a one-year offset project from us under the same funding program. And so we got into discussions early on about what information uh, and expertise we can share. And so, for example, uh, the uh, these indicators are, are our experienced developing indicators and gathering them from the literature uh, has been shared with them and some of the cal same calculations that we do in our framework is, is now done in a, in a climate data processing and, and portal, web portal tool that they have. Um, but there's probably lots more that we could, uh, we have lots of mutual interest and we think uh, we should keep going with discussions about uh, what we might be able to do together. Um, interactivity. By interactivity, I, I'm as I said at the beginning of today, uh, or close to the beginning of today, we found that as we put more and more detail into our version of an Envision model, um, it, it's big and slow now. It's, it's not something that you could quickly explore, not uh, proactively, scenario expansion for ourselves, and uh, uh, do some additional processing to see what the possibilities are. And so, um, I'm interested in, and I know others are interested in saying, what do we do to get things a little more interactive? Now, one would be, we could still do all the things that we're doing, but do it on a smaller region at a time, and then you, then you can start doing things, okay, well, what if I change this? Run it, see what the impact is, and so you could do some more of that, that what if scenario interactive, shorter term uh, 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 processing. But if you keep things the way we have it now, the, the cost is that you're now, you can't ask some of the same questions. You can certainly ask what happens at a farm, and it's meaning certainly questions, but you can't ask the sort of regional question, it's the summing it up across large spaces. Um, so that's one direction you go, but if you want to do regional stuff still, you probably have to choose some other things. Um, we have thought about um, uh, maybe setting uh, with it sort of instead of having a full representation of a distribution of fictitious but realistic farms across the whole region like we have now, maybe just set up some farm types and, set, and do the runs for different farm types and uh, see what the consequences are over some region that makes sense and then collect those outputs and have some kind of interactive uh, probably a website where farmers could go in and say, I've got this kind of farm, how would different climate change scenarios affect me? So that's another way you could maybe do it. And then I've also been thinking, uh, there's a lot of good work here uh, on this campus out of the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center about how do you develop actively scenarios, not just maps, but interactive electronic atlases that use uh, multimedia, so even diff different senses or, or possibilities, and different ways of presenting the data in a very rich way to communicate an idea. So we take what we've done and move beyond individual graphs, individual maps, and try and create something that is a little more immersive, using different possibilities of visualizing the data through a web-based interface um, to help communicate the questions about uh, extreme weather impacts on agriculture in this region. Uh, I think that there's some really good tools out there. It definitely would take uh, some significant work to, to develop uh, the, uh, the technology so that it, it uh, not just the technology, but the time to figure out what the design of a an effective communication uh, uh, opportunity would be there. And then we talked about, like, what about looking at some other environmental processes like greenhouse gas emission or, or storage. And so there are, for example, greenhouse gas calculator uh, efforts uh, out of uh, out of the experiment. Uh, I'm right here beside us, right? It's, or is he based there? Uh, out of Ag Canada, anyway. Ag Canada, yeah. Ag Canada. So out of Lethbridge. Out of Lethbridge, thank you. So we, we've talked uh, uh, about that, but thank you. So we... Things... Uh, uh, going to... Well. I was thinking, going, we've talked, uh, Pierre Yves has joined us here now, uh, as very uh, suitable thinking quality rating system. We've talked a couple times about, we, you know, we are using it right now, just using the basic uh, land classes uh, to determine what 
parcels of land are suitable for different farm types, but there's uh, Pierre Eve has done work, for example, on on looking at how LSRS ratings can change under different climate scenarios. Ratings can uh, we've probably never pursued uh, in this work. And I forgot to wear my glasses up here. That's why I'm squinting a lot here. Um, so in general, other processes and other actors, for example, bringing in market forces. We were talking the other day about what, it, you know, we could do something where you look at what are the impacts of different commodity prices. In general, how other systems interact with the climate crop processes that we focused on today. And Tanya gave another example about market forces uh, uh, when we were talking yesterday. Uh, you know, considering uh, not just buying a farms, but in this landscape, there's also a lot of leasing going on. So, what were, what, how could this, these scenarios play out differently if you brought in leasing um, for the purpose of expansion, uh, and then you could get into actually looking at land value. That's bringing in different knowledge, different expertise, so you would probably need different partners that could help figure out what the appropriate logic is to do that kind of work, and what are the appropriate and significant questions to be asking. Anything you think I'm missing there? If anybody else thinks of things from the audience, feel free to let us know of some obvious things you think we should be doing. How do you make the changes? Well, uh, we've talked about this sprinkled throughout the presentation, but just f to bring it all together very, very quickly. Some of it is just configuration. Some of that gets done through the interface. Some goes through the configuration files. Um, you've, you've seen a, a bunch of them. I put them in the slides here, so they're all together in the, in the, in the package that goes up on the web. But uh, uh, we've got an example here of one of the files uh, and repeatedly in different presentations where you set things like the growth rate of different kinds of farms. And then this one here is the file where you do things like set up what all the different scenarios are. And then there's actually another file all using this XML uh, encoding system another file that sets up what all the different policies are. So a lot can be done uh, either through direct editing of those files or some of that can also be inter I mean, edited through the Envision interface. Um, a lot of work to do changes often involves adding more or changing how you've structured the database and that can, as you saw with uh, um, SAMHSA slides, that can be a pretty significant process to get, get set up in the first place or to make big changes to. Um, but that's part of why we wanted to present some details about that today to document uh, what we did and so that if, if somebody's looking at the scripts we've got posted on the website in the future, uh, they've got a presentation they can go back to to help make sense of what's up there and what we were doing and why we were doing it. So we're sharing all of that. Uh, some of it's already on the site as we're getting all the pieces together still and getting it up, uh, making sure that we get it up in a way that it actually can be comprehended. And then some things that you might want to do actually require new programming. Um, and this is all done with open source tools. Um, the, the whole Envision framework is, is uh, open source and you can see all the source code uh, at the, uh, it's hosted off of an SVN server at uh, the, uh, uh, at Oregon State University and there's links to that, uh, that site from our, our project's webpage. Uh, and of course, you have to find someone to do all the programming, so you just have to budget in the time and or money to get that done. And uh, it would require collaboration, so just returning to that invitation, if anybody would like to work with us, we'd be happy to hear from them. So my example files. Oh, and yes, so I forgot, I specifically showed that this is, uh, and somebody else showed this as well, this is the... Uh, I'll show yeah, it's coming up on my screen, not yours, but, and because my computer rebooted, the login is gone, but I'll try to get it to come back. Okay, so all the uh, Envision source code is viewable straight through the web interface through this SVN server, but you can check out a, uh, a copy of your of your own uh, and get the whole source code on your computer. Obviously I clicked on a wrong link there or something's just slow today. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, all the, the different study areas, different projects that have worked with uh, uh, the Envision team in the past, they had the study area database uh, are up on this server so we uh, 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 
we have a link on our website to where you go to get uh, to, to if you want to just quickly view what's in our database and uh, I didn't post it because I noticed it's uh, right now our instructions for how to download your own copy are are sort of geared towards our own development team here and I wanted to little, make it a little more public friendly so we'll get up that up in the next day, few days as well of how you can download all our data files. And I think that's it, but I wanted to just go through that to invite any comments or questions that might still be out there. Um, I know people have been coming and going a lot through this, so I don't know if we still have around, but if anybody has any questions or comments they'd like to add, uh, this would be a great time. All right, well, thanks to everybody that participated, and uh, um, we'll get everything that we've promised that isn't already up on our website will be up there soon. And uh, thanks to all of you, especially in the room, and to people that collaborated that aren't with us here right now that have made this possible.